Um, so thank you everybody for attending our third major event in One Quantum Philippines. My name is Bobby Corpus. Um, yeah, so uh, let me introduce first uh, One Quantum Philippines. Uh, who, who are we? So we are a chapter of One Quantum Global. Um, we started as uh, Quantum Computing Philippines in, uh, in 2017. Um, but we had a hard time uh, penetrating into the awareness of Filipino people <clears throat> because for one thing, quantum computing is not an easy subject. So fortunately, One Quantum uh, Global uh, noticed us and uh, they absorbed us into the organization. And um, so we have the same mission, which is to uh, increase the awareness of Filipinos in quantum computing, uh, make quantum computing uh, accessible, to those who are interested and to introduce quantum computing as early as possible into our kids' um, education to make them quantum native. So today we are very excited because um, we have a very special guest. Uh, he's also an inspirational guest. Um, he's a Filipino. Um, his name is Nardo Manaloto. I'm going to uh, read his bio. So. Nardo is a managing partner at Qubits Ventures, a venture capital firm investing in early stage quantum and photonics uh, tech startup. Nardo is a computer scientist, uh, deep tech executive and startup entrepreneur with 25 years experience in innovation, emerging technologies, startup acceleration and ecosystems building and digi digital transformation. Nardo also runs a quantum and photonics startup accelerator in partnership with Founder Institute, a global accelerator in Silicon Valley. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, please welcome Nardo Manaloto to talk to us about how to build your quantum computing startup. So I give the floor now to you, Nardo. Okay. Hey, Bobby. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, uh, One Quantum Philippine. Thank you for uh, Philippines. Well, thank you for having me uh, present to you guys. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and share my presentation. So just give me a moment here. Okay. Are you able to see my presentation? Uh, yes. Okay, so my presentation today is uh, building your quantum computing startup. So as way of introduction, Qubits Ventures is a pre-seed venture fund in California investing in quantum and photonics technology startups. Uh, background wise, uh, you know, as Bobby had uh, alluded to, I'm a computer scientist, deep tech thought leader, deep tech angel investor with 25 plus years in deep tech experience seven years leading a large uh, healthcare company's innovation team and fund, uh, seven years running a deep tech accelerator. Uh, since I'm a computer scientist, I've developed product in deep tech products in AI, robotic process automation, big data and analytics, and IoT. So the first thing I wanted to do is start it off that, you know, a lot of people always think that quantum, quantum is limited to just quantum computing. It really is not, right? So uh, when you start thinking about building your startup, you have to look at it from a very broad perspective. Look at it from a quantum technology uh, standpoint. So quantum technology is definitely a more broader field than just quantum computing. So quantum computing is a subset of quantum technologies. So what is quantum technology? Quantum technology is really a class of technology that works by using the principles of quantum mechanics. Um, if you take a look at the pictures here from left to right, some of these quantum technologies include quantum sensors, quantum networking and internet, quantum chip and component, quantum software and applications, and of course, quantum computers. So according to McKinsey, the, the three main areas for quantum technology are computing, communications, and sensing, because they enable broad and new capabilities. 
So these are uh, three areas that it's normally categorized by industry, but you can definitely uh, be broader than that, right? So for example, quantum software uh, would be one area that you can also look into as a big area. Uh, and also, this is another view of, of what quantum technologies also contains. On the quantum application side, uh, we're talking about simulation, algorithms, uh, AI, machine learning, deep learning, optimization, cryptography. On the quantum systems uh, uh, side of things, these include system software, operating systems, tools and utilities, programming platforms, data and analytics, and quantum networks. Uh, quantum devices includes sensors, chips and components, photonics devices, memory, uh, and ASICs. And then a big category that you also need to look at is what I call transitional or bridge technology. So what does that mean? Uh, we're talking about hybrid computing, quantum-inspired hybrid application, integration software, integrating high, uh, classical and quantum uh, computing together, harmonizing tech and anything that has to do with interconnects. Uh, so I wanted to show you this uh, industry specific application slide that I have. So you could think about, you know, there are many things that you could do with quantum, especially on the application side of things, right? So this is just a few examples of uh, industry specific applications that you can build. Uh, I'm going to read through some of them, but not all of them. And so on the high tech side, uh, search engines, uh, in, uh, intelligent automation, uh, software verification and validation, finance side, risk analysis, fraud detection, market simulation, pharma and healthcare, molecular design, drug discovery, personalized medicine, genomic sequencing, industrial goods, logistic, automotive, aerospace, process optimization, scheduling optimization, and so on and so forth. So why now and why quantum? So we have a, why now is because we have an enormous market size. We already have significant startup funding uh, happening uh, across the globe. There are already numerous exit potentials, uh, you know, with these uh, nascent companies. Uh, there are also multiple startup exit that's already there and enterprise uh, is already starting to adopt their quantum technology. Uh, there was a recent survey uh, last year, 70% um, of 400 companies surveyed already have an in-house quantum computing program. This is true from a U.S. perspective. I think from a Philippines perspective, uh, we are probably still in the early stage of trying to learn what quantum technologies and quantum uh, computing is all about. Uh, but here are some of the things that's already happening here, at least here in the U.S., right? So we have big tech already developing quantum computers, uh, which is accessible to the Philippines as well. Um, Google, IBM, Intel, Honeywell, Alibaba, quantum computing as a service already exists. So through Amazon Bracket and Microsoft Azure Quantum. And then we have a lot of lo enterprises already piloting quantum technologies, as uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, at least globally, investment landscape is doing pretty pretty well. So the McKinsey partners look into looked into quantum computing market to reach one trillion by 2035. That is a large market size. Uh, research and markets overall global quantum technology market will reach 42.4 billion by 2027, and that's just to name a few. And startup uh, funding activity has reached, uh, actually doubled that of uh, 2020. It reached 1.4 billion to 2 to 2.1 billion uh, in 2021. And then some industry updates that you are probably hearing. You know, there's a lot of work happening with uh, with Google claiming quantum advantage. There's work related to the first ever quantum circuit coming out of Australia. Uh, MIT uh, creating next generation uh, quantum sensors uh, that is uh, has level of sensitivity that's never been seen before, and so on and so forth. So really, it is really the best time to start a quantum tech startup right now, right? So how will you go about starting this process? So building your startup. 
Well, first thing you really want to do is really determine what kind of a company you are, right? That you're building. Are you a dog or a muffin? So this is a very well-known pictorial of uh, when AI looks into uh, learning uh, classification of, uh, of objects, right? So it's the same thing with companies. You need to know what kind of company you're building. Do you have an identity crisis? I've seen companies that have actually built, uh, you know, that have a vision that's building multiple companies all at once, which is not going to work from an investor standpoint. And also, uh, there are also a lot of startups building uh, companies uh, basically because uh, of opportunities that were presented to them. So some of the things that you need to think about are, you know, what are the hard problems you're trying to solve, uh, looking into framing that problem, making sure that you are looking at the problem properly as opposed to the symptoms of the problem, and then looking at it from a point solution versus platform perspective as well, right? So uh, don't be everything and anything to everyone. You have to look into figuring out your focus. Uh, positioning and messaging is also quite key as part of this process. Uh, also, you have to know what your value proposition because your value proposition is uh, on the on your startup is basically the one that's going to generate revenue and the need. And you also have to look into your current and future capability development. So one thing that I always uh, talk to startups about is they, they need to also have a vision. Uh, what is their bigger vision for their uh, startup that they're building? Sometimes they get stuck into looking at the small piece of the pie, but actually when you look at it from a product vision standpoint, uh, there could be a, a bigger piece of market and bigger uh, a bigger way to generate revenue uh, based on the vision that you outline. So here's a product vision canvas that I'd like to share that basically just gives you a framework on how to look into how to put your vision together uh, so it's easily understood. So from a from an investor point of view, the first thing I always look at is building your team. How are you? How did you build your team? Right. So here are a few of these traits that I am uh, very interested in. So I want to make sure that I see strong and, and diverse leadership, uh, expertise to product alignment, right? So because if you're building something in quantum, you want to make sure that the experts are quantum experts uh, so that they're totally aligned. Uh, ability to collaborate, uh, people that can collaborate can get things done much quicker. Uh, the big one for a lot of folks is basically their ability to listen and be coachable. So coachable meaning, you know, make sure that you are able to improve based upon the advice of uh, other smart people that has been there and done that and that basically have lots of insights to share. Uh, a few more uh, traits that I'd like to see in the team, uh, highly intuitive, open communication, culture aligned, uh, a culture of continuous learning and a passion to drive action. So as part of your team, you also have to build your advisory group, right? So uh, when I, whenever I look at a, a quantum startup, I want to know if whether their advisory group uh, have people that are known experts in their field, right? So because these experts, uh, they need to contribute their knowledge and insights that you may have a gap in. Uh, and they are the one that also helps you bring credibility and visibility to the market and to the investors that you pitch to. Uh, and then the other uh, part to advisory groups are basically uh, they, they should be able to help you accelerate their startup as well by connecting you to other experts, uh, high value people, uh, acts, and then help you access to um, give you access to uh, proof of concept projects, especially if they're well connected in large enterprises. They should be able to provide you access to funding. And if you if they are a true believer in your company, hopefully they're also able to provide you with some seed funding. So build your product. So when, whenever I look at uh, I look at any of the products being developed or being researched in any quantum technology startup company, I also take a look at many different angles, right? So one is uh, is it a defensible business? Meaning, are they building something that actually solve a problem or are they just building a technology that basically for technology's sake? 
right? So is it disrupted? Meaning, is it something that would uh, definitely change the world or change a particular area uh, or uh, or disrupt a particular industry or, or a particular segment of that industry? Uh, I also look into what is your IP and patent portfolio. So when you when you normally when uh, quantum technology startups uh, uh, gets created. Uh, they, they normally come out of research organizations and universities, and a lot of the IP and patent uh, are owned by universities. So that is a good start, right? So what you want to do is basically, you know, start off with that. But as you build your company, make sure that you get to create IP and patents, uh, you know, when you are a startup, not at, that is outside of the university. You need to also map out your vision and roadmap. Uh, care about the problem to solution fit. What that means is if you're building, if you're looking at a particular, a particular problem, is the solution really the, light, the right solution uh, to address it? Uh, because it'll help you get to product market fit much quicker. Uh, some of the other areas, uh, clear and realistic path to monetization uh, and use of open source code. So. Uh, this one is a little tricky because, you know, the open source code community, basically, depending on the kind of license that you see there, uh, if you use open source, if you have, if you happen to create something proprietary and really innovative using that open source, uh, uh, open source code, and you have to basically provide your code back to the community, then you basically invalidate your patent, right? So make sure you be careful with that. Uh, we always ask for a demonstrable prototype or MVP. So when so a key aspect that we always look at is, uh, do you have just everything on paper and everything is just research? So you are definitely very early. Uh, a lot of investors are always looking at uh, whether you have something that you could demonstrate. Uh, some of the other uh, positive things that we'd like to see are, Basically, you have access to university labs uh, to build your product. That means uh, you can fabricate uh, many different things in a uh, cheap manner. Uh, and then also access to foundries that can help you build prototypes. So this one, I, I wanted to spend a little bit of time on this one. So what this is uh, basically shows you a product slash market slash revenue roadmap. So what you also what you want to think about is uh, when you're creating your product roadmap, how do you also roadmap your go to market uh, aspect of that? Right. Uh, how do you also roadmap the revenue? So, for example, if I am if you're building a quantum computing company and uh, the end to create a quantum computer will take time. So let's say it's going to take seven to 10 years time. Uh, what you want to do is, okay, so to build uh, to build a product sequence and market sequence and revenue sequence that will help you get there. So you're building market traction and revenue. So if I am to out, uh, lay out the product roadmap for a quantum computer company, for example, first thing I want to do is, you know, maybe in the first two years, I would build out uh, a quantum photon detector. So that is something that is uh, marketable uh, in two to three years. And then in three to five years, uh, from year three to five, I would build the quantum computing chip. So that chip is now marketable as well. Uh, and then from year five to year seven, then that's the time I'll be building the quantum computer itself. So you can see uh, there's a progression when it comes to product going out uh, and then getting to market and revenue being generated as each phase of the product development of the overall or of the overall vision uh, gets done. So this one, you know, you create a startup. The first thing, you know, you you probably will get a lot of investors and and people asking you about, well, you know, what is your um, business model? How are you making money, right? So there's an exercise out there called uh, mon money slash value flow diagram. Uh, 
uh, basically what it is, it's you basically out, uh, outline all of your, identify and outline all of your stakeholders, right? So who are your customers? Who are your suppliers? Who are your partners? Who are uh, each one of these components? And basically uh, uh, map out where the money comes and goes in and out, uh, what value is being provided to each of the stakeholder. So you have a clear understanding where you can generate revenue and where and where your costs are and where the and the value that you actually provide. Uh, in this example, you know uh, this company, which is a more on the uh, 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 elect uh, electricity type, electricity type uh, startup, uh, they basically charge real estate companies in installation fees as well as yearly subscription for the use of their software. Right. So the revenue model type is subscription. So you need to do this money and value flow diagram as you start thinking about building your startup. And then I think a lot of people have probably heard about the business model canvas. So this one, it, it, it's a really good exercise to do, um, mainly because uh, in the single page, you can actually you can actually define uh, what your company is going to look like or what your startup is going to look like. Here's one that is specific to quantum. This is a quantum assisted traffic solution. So quantum um, software as a service and quantum platform as a service. So you could see some of their key partners are uh, quantum companies, including D-Wave, Google, uh, cloud service providers, 5G networks, traffic data provider, academia, key activities. So these are things that they do uh, inside of their companies. They're, they mine and analyze data. They develop and test algorithms, uh, simulations and optimization, implementation and training, so on and so forth. Uh, key resources, uh, Volkswagen brands. So this is actually a real use case. So Volkswagen is working on a quantum assisted traffic solution. Uh, quantum AI, machine learning, deep learning algorithm, and platform uh, people, quantum experts, uh, Volkswagen technology experts. And here are the, the key things here are the value proposition. What value are you providing? In the case of the quantum software as a service, they're providing predictive and truly real-time cloud-based solution for traffic, op traffic optimization. Uh, vehicle assignment, so on and so forth. So you can see the makeup of uh, a business model canvas, including customer relationships, customer segments, channels, revenue streams, and cost structure. So the other thing you also have to get, you know, as you start thinking about your startup and building your startup, you have to get familiar with the business models. There are so many different business models out there. And if you don't even, you know, try to learn what the business models are, you won't get a familiarity as to what model will fit your particular startup, right? So here's just a listing of a few uh, of these business models. So a lot of people are familiar with subscription model, uh, bundling model, freemium model, uh, razor blades model, leasing model, crowdsourcing, uh, franchise model, distribution, uh, marketplace model, utility model, licensing, affiliate, infomediary model. So there are so many different models out there. And you don't have to be stuck with just one model. So as you're building and thinking about what business model to support, uh, you have to look at how your money flow and value flow diagram looks like and uh, create the right association to the right business model that fit those particular uh, money and value flow. Okay, so this one is a very, very important slide. So what as a startup, you need to be driven to compete and you also need to know how to increase your valuation. So a way, a good way of doing that is uh, building your competitive advantage, right? So, but what does competitive advantage mean? So here are, you know, some of the well-known competitive advantage that a lot of startups actually use here in the U.S. Uh, production advantages. So does your startup have production advantage? 
right? So is it a low, is, are you providing something that is lower cost than your competitors? Uh, are you doing something that is highly complex that your competitors cannot do? So that is a competitive advantage. High switching cost. So meaning um, if you are a startup that created a product that is uh, rooted inside of a company and it's being used in the company, uh, will, will, if a company decide to switch to another provider or to another product, is it going to be a high switching cost? So that is also a competitive advantage, right? Because if if they if a if an enterprise is going to have um, uh, a significant cost to switch or a significant cost in terms of time and implementation and transitioning, uh, that is definitely a competitive advantage to you. Meaning uh, you'll create enterprise that would be long term clients. Uh, you also have to look at your pace of innovation. So let's a good example of pace of innovation is uh, Elon Musk, right? So Elon has done many different companies. All of them are in, in unicorn status and nothing he, touch, he touches uh, doesn't turn to gold, right? So, but his pace of innovation and uh, doing uh, things that are really emerging and advanced uh, is quite fast. So you need to figure out how to, to do that. Uh, network effects, so meaning, how do you get the virality of your product? How do you get how do you get your uh, product and or service that you provide out there from uh, uh, that you provide to your customers? Uh, how can your customer actually uh, give you virality? What kind of uh, approach, go to market strategy do you need to do to give you virality and network effects so you don't have to sell as hard? You also have to look at your intangible assets. So what are intangible assets? These are your proprietary data and technology that you build, the IP and patents that you have, uh, the portfolio that you have. And also, you also have to look at your differentiation, right? So what makes you different? Uh, just, just because you have an IP patent doesn't mean that you're differentiated, right? So you need to know why, how are you differentiated and unique compared to your competitors? Uh, and uh, looking at from a market standpoint, you're, you're, pro you're the only product that is standing out there that is solving a particular uh, problem. Uh, so that those are all good uh, competitive advantage. Uh, another one is uh, brand loyalty. So the way you can create brand loyalty is by providing the best user experience for your product. So if you're building, let's say, a quantum uh, AI analytics product, you want to make sure that the, the business intelligence aspect of it is easy to use, right? So that creates brand loyalty. And then the last one is your ability to scale. So this is a huge problem for a lot of startups. Uh, you know, they're good at creating prototypes. They're good at creating the first MVP but they don't think about, okay, well, how do I actually scale it? So the way to do that is make sure that you're able to partner with foundries. Uh, foundries are basically uh, service providers that can help you build uh, a process for manufacturing your product at scale. So th these are a few uh, items in the area of competitive advantage and how to increase your valuation. So, you know, a lot of start, you know, one of the things when building a startup is it's, it's good that you know your risk right away, right? So as you start thinking about your company, a lot of people don't even think about risk and think about uh, building a company that is risk mitigated, right? So here is a list of many different risks that you need to kind of be concerned about. Uh, and I'll just name a few of them. Uh, capability risk. This is the risk that the startup is really unable to scale its capability on a timely basis and at levels required. Uh, funding risk, that's a uh, risk all the time. The risk that funding will not be available at a level or timing required for a startup to succeed. So make sure you know your uh, fund, uh, fund strategy and fund management uh, in order for you to mitigate this risk. Uh, regulatory risk, right? So if you're building, say, let's say something 
quantum for pharma, right? Quantum AI for pharma for drug discovery. There's a lot of regulatory risk that goes along with that, which changes the cost structure and uh, creates a higher cost for startup because of re regulatory and legal uh, uh, constraints. Uh, research risk. So this one is also very key for any quantum startups, right? So this is the risk that the quality of the initial research upon which key company assumptions were based was flawed in an impact, impactful way. So you're putting your you're, you're putting you're creating a startup based on the research that you have. You need to make sure that the research is solid because that is the foundation of your product or service, right? So uh, the way for you to mitigate that is you, you need to make sure that you're disciplined in in studying the, the data, uh, doing a lot of testing, doing a lot of validation, getting a lot of feedback. So research risk is one of those that you definitely need to, uh, to address. So CB Insights, uh, this is a slide from CB Insights, which is a good, uh, you know, marketing re research firm here in uh, in uh, in the U.S. Uh, these are the top 20 reasons startups fail. Okay, so the reason I'm showing this to you is, you know, when you think about your startup, the, I'm giving you the failure uh, rationale here already, so you can avoid them, right? So one is there's no market need. You know, there are a lot of startups that are just building technology for the sake of technology. So it's not a research project. You're, you know, a startup is a business uh, running out of cash, right? So that's always a big one. Uh, not knowing where the funding can go and where you can avail yourself of funding and so on and so forth is, a, is, a, is definitely a big one. Uh, not having the right team. Remember in that slide that I have about building the team? You need to make sure that you have alignment on and the right kind of complementary skills uh, that can help you build the product. So let's say if you're building a quantum photonics uh, type device, you need to make sure that you have a quantum expert and a photonics expert uh, as part of the team. Uh, you get outcompeted because you're slow, right? That could be uh, a big reason. Uh, pricing and cost issues, user uh, user experience is not that friendly, uh, product without a business model, poor marketing, ignoring the customers, product mistime, right? So, well, in the, in the timing aspect of it, I don't think you'll go wrong with the timing right now because uh, creating a quantum startup is good at this point. So funding sources. Uh, when you know when you first create your company, the first thing that you need to rely on is uh, definitely yourself. If you have some funds to uh, to uh, put your startup together, definitely use that. Uh, you can rely on family and friends. Uh, you need to uh, you know I'm sure that they believe in you. That you need to get uh, funding from uh, from them as well. Uh, and then you progress to angel investors that can give you uh, angel funding. Uh, you also have to look into what we call non-diluted grants. So there are grants out there, you know, um, that's available for research projects uh, to further your research. And these are outright grants. It's money given to you uh, uh, to, to, for, to further pursue your uh, research in the technology that you're trying to build. Uh, of course, venture capital funds, similar to Qubits Ventures. Uh, you also have to look into startup contests as well. So as you can see, you know, startups need to be uh, scrappy. You, they need to join hackathons. They need to join contests in order to survive and uh, get money and, uh, and win credibility and visibility, so on and so forth. We also have a lot of startup accelerators out there, at least here in the U.S. Uh, hopefully, uh, even though um, in the Philippines, uh, we don't have as many uh, accelerators uh, like uh, here. Uh, I think you can still apply, uh, you know, for example, uh, and I'll talk, tell you about uh, my quantum and photonics accelerator uh, shortly. You also have access to crowdfunding sites, uh, small business associations, non-for-profit companies. Uh, there are non-for-profit companies out there that have a mission uh, to basically make the world better. And the way they see 
making the world better is to funding, uh, providing grants to uh, startup companies as well as one of the buckets. So a lot of people don't know that. So uh, non-for-profit companies are good funding sources. And of course, there's the alternative lenders. Uh, so these would be like bank loans, uh, uh, debt, uh, uh, debt, uh, debt loans and, and stuff like that. Okay, so I wanted to give you a view of uh, startup accelerators that we have here, uh, specific to quantum. Um, so we have Duality, which is a quantum specific uh, accelerator out in Chicago. Uh, NextCorp, which is a quantum and photonics accelerator out of New York. Swiss Quantum Hub is a quantum accelerator in Switzerland. Creative Destruction Lab is a, uh, uh, they, they have a quantum specific accelerator in Canada. Uh, Techstars Industries of the Future, uh, this is based in the U.S. Uh, they accept uh, quantum applications. And of course, my own uh, quantum and photonics accelerator, which I uh, partnered with Founder Institute on. So I wanted to let you know, so if you are uh, in the Philippines or anywhere in the globe that you are watching this, uh, we take uh, any applications from around the globe uh, who wants to join the, the accelerator. So the info you could click on here uh, is uh, fi.co slash program slash quantum. Our application deadline is October 26, uh, 2022. So we're looking to basically, uh, for this cohort, we're looking to have 10 to 15 companies join us as part of this, uh, as part of this acceleration. And that's pretty much it. So I'd be open to questions if you have any. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Nardo. That was uh, really very informative. Um, I must admit that uh, your slides, like most of them, are the first time I've seen. So yeah. So uh, for a question and answer, um, let me let me read some questions here. Um, so this is uh, a question from Dieter Schneider. Uh, what do you think is the biggest hurdle in the development of practical quantum computing applications as of the moment? Uh, funding, technology, uh, or people? Uh, why? Yeah, so uh, actually very good question. So uh, on the application side, uh, I think it's it's not the, uh, I think it's probably more on the people side, right? So because uh, on the on the people side, uh, the, the, there's not so many people that knows how to create quantum computing uh, applications yet. Uh, a lot of people are still trying to learn, you know, creating quantum gates. Uh, they're trying to learn, you know, specific uh, algorithms, uh, quantum algorithms that they could use. So I think it's more on the people side. On the technology side, we already have quantum computing as a service that you can pretty much sign up on, like an Amazon bracket, uh, and sign up for an INQ account or an IBM Qiskit account, uh, you know, with IBM. So from a technology access perspective, it's 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 already there. Uh, from a funding perspective, until you develop something meaningful, uh, you're not you're not really going to get funded, right? So, in order for you to basically make something happen, you need the people to actually take it on and create something uh, meaningful uh, first. Uh, so, a lot of people are starting off with quantum applications. Uh, I don't think the quant the practical the quantum computing technology itself is a hindrance because there are also what we call hybrid applications or quantum inspired that is a combination of classical and uh, and, and quantum uh, kind of applications, right? So I think it's more of a people barrier at this point. Thank you for that, uh, Nardo. Another question here is from Lester Narito. <clears throat> so his question is, uh, with quantum applications, would that mean doing quantum programming? To be used by industries yes uh, it would be exactly that right so uh, so let me give you several examples um, of uh, some production actually 
uh, production level uh, quantum software or application. Uh, here in the U.S., uh, in, in the port of L.A., we had an issue with uh, uh, logistics and supply chain being bogged down at the, at the ports of L.A. And uh, we there's a company called Savant X that created a, uh, a, a, qu a quantum optimization, uh, a quantum optimization algorithm uh, that the port of L.A. can use using the D-Wave annealer, uh, quantum annealer. So that is definitely quantum programming specific for uh, in the, the logistics and supply industry, right? Uh, another one, another example is I know of a startup that is building, uh, building a drug, uh, doing drug discovery using quantum algorithms. And so they are able to uh, create uh, and design new kinds of drugs uh, much faster than uh, classical systems. Uh, and so you could you you could see where pharma is going with it, right? So another one would be uh, quantum uh, quantum sensing in healthcare, right? So creating, let's say, the brain cap, so you could do the brain scan uh, on on uh, on top of your head, right? And looking at the uh, the electrical uh, output of your brain. So that 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 is being done already uh, by a startup in Colorado. Wow. So uh, we have another question here from Brian Seidelwax. Um, what's the life cycle uh, from startup through rounds of funding to no longer a startup? Uh, very good question, Brian. So uh, the, the startup uh, usually, um, the, the startup is always a startup until they progress from a what I call product market fit scenario, right? So the whole premise of you doing this is you start off with your research, you take it out of the uh, academia or research organization, you create uh, your first uh, prototype and you hone that prototype and validate that prototype uh, to ensure that you are solving a particular problem, right? Uh, in order for you to hone on the actual fit of the uh, uh, of your product to the um, of your product to the market, you have to go through several rounds of taking it out there. So there's going to be many rounds of uh, uh, of getting customer input, uh, and to get and to get customer input and to get pro a proof of concept projects done, uh, you also need to have funding to do that, right? So uh, from early stage PC to seed. Uh, so to seed, uh, once you're in the seed stage, you should be at, uh, you know, close to product market fit. Uh, and by the time you're series A funding, you should be at product market fit, hopefully, right? Um, but if you can't attain product market fit, that's when, uh, that's when you're you'll no, you'll probably be no longer a startup at that point because there's no traction, no revenue generation or anything of that sort. You, you didn't achieve the fit aspect. Thank you for that. Another question from Lorena Villanueva. Uh, hello, Nardo. Greetings from Manila. I have a question. What do you think is the biggest uh, mistake quantum startup can can make yeah i i think one is uh I, the identity crisis is i think is the biggest mistake because sometimes you know uh you know there are a lot of startups that pitch to me that basically says oh i am this but when i look at their stuff uh they're actually not that right so uh sometimes they would pitch and say oh you know i'm a startup and my quantum uh you know, product can do this, this, and this. And then when I take a look at it, uh, basically it's like three different products in one. Uh, so it's not really a product yet, right? At an early stage, uh, you wanna make sure that you have a, a particular problem that you are really honing on, uh, focusing on uh, to solve and solve it really well, right? So I think the biggest mistake what a startup could start off with is like, really not knowing who they are and what identity they have and what problem they're solving. Thank you for that. <clears throat> so Brian is, uh, oh, yeah. So uh, Brian has uh, another question here. If someone has an idea for a startup, what is the best way to approach you with it? Can it be just an idea looking for a thumbs up or thumbs down? Oh uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I am always available to chat with anyone that is uh, looking to uh, 
to build a company or start up in this space, right? It's such a nascent space. Uh, and then if they are looking to explore, uh, even uh, that's why my accelerator is here, right? So the accelerator is also one of those where if you're interested in uh, honing in on your idea and seeing, you know, where, where it can go, you can be surrounded with mentors and advisors uh, with, within, the, within my own ecosystem of investors, business people, entrepreneurs, quantum scientists and engineers to help you uh, hone it down. Uh, but, you know, during an idea stage, uh, really looking at it from a thumbs down, uh, thumbs up perspective is probably the wrong way to look at it. What you need to do is basically uh, uh, look, at an, uh, look at an idea, uh, get more input and see how you could uh, change that idea or, or uh, improve upon that idea in order for you to hone in on uh, solving the right thing. Right. So it's never just. Don't give up uh, on your idea. It's never just about a thumbs up and a thumbs down. It's about how do you improve it and how uh, how how you can best get input in order for you to actually uh, hone in on the right idea. Yeah. So uh, another question here from Asher: uh, What field do you consider a low-hanging fruit in quantum computing? Yeah, uh, one of my favorite uh, favorite field is quantum sensing, uh, because you don't have to build an entire uh, an entire computer, right? So it, basically, you're building sensors still working within uh, within the space of quantum, right? So quantum sensing, uh, anything in the healthcare space, uh, quantum algorithms, uh, I, I consider those low hanging fruit. You know, uh, companies are being funded for that. Uh, a, a, a couple of notable companies that I would mention uh, in the area of uh, quantum algorithms are uh, Multiverse Computing uh, being one and Polaris QB on the drug discovery side of things. So quantum applications, I, I think system um, software and, and tools and utilities as well, right? So for example, uh, we need new kinds of programming tools. That is much easier than what we that than what's currently out there, right? So you could build companies out of that. Uh, we need uh, nice. tools and utilities that can help you uh, have better error correction, right? So we or better uh, design of uh, the design. Um, uh, the other area is in the area of photonics. Photonics is a much more mature uh, mature industry. A lot it's going through a re innovations phase. So look into uh, uh, anything that's photonics related. Uh, that's uh, actually a very good um, thing because uh, uh, one of our members here, Burns, is uh, is a uh, photonics expert. That's so oh. I wonder if uh, Burns is the question. I think he has. Uh, so another question here is uh, from Neil Ortega. Uh, do you have a statistic on the on the success rate of quantum software versus quantum hardware startups? Uh, it is too early to tell, right? Because there's only a handful of these companies. Uh, there, so in my database, I have around uh, close to 1,000 companies uh, in in all different areas uh, because the, the, these are nascent, right? So these are new companies that just really came out of the woodwork. Uh, the, the, the success rate is really not there yet the, from, well, the success rate for quantum hardware startups, especially in the quantum computing is much higher. So the quantum computers are being funded like INQ, SciQuantum, Rigetti, uh, those are getting a lot of the money. Uh, but there are also a lot of software being, uh, being funded as well. A, a few I mentioned already. Uh, but in terms of how they compare, uh, you know, I, I don't have statistics on that yet. Uh, but I think uh, what you're going to find is um, uh, that uh, there's more than just quantum software being funded. There are also chips being funded. There's a lot of chips I know that are being funded, component uh, parts being funded, uh, besides just quantum software and hardware. Okay. Uh we actually have so many questions here, so I, I hope you don't mind. Don't um, mind. So another one from uh, Dieter. Uh, if I have a business plan, do you want me to send it to you? Uh, 
Well, uh, sure, you can send, certainly send, but I would prefer if you send a pitch deck. <laughs> uh, if it's a business, if it's the traditional business plan where it, it, it it's like fifty pages long, I think it'll be best if you boil it down to uh, a ten uh, a ten page uh, slide deck. Okay, thank you. Okay, so from uh, <clears throat> Burns Buena Obra uh, in the Philippines, the push is in agriculture and power. So quantum biology, quantum agriculture may get funding. What do you think of this direction? Oh, uh, I, so I, I love this question. Uh, quantum biology is a really an interesting field, but it is so nascent, right? So the um, that space is so early on that even here in the U.S., it's there's not even a quantum biology startup yet. Right. So there's a lot of synthetic bio that's probably going to start going into quantum uh, and using quantum as a tool to improve their uh, probably their simulation and uh, algorithms and stuff like that. So that's but when we're talking about quantum biology, uh, it has a different meaning. Right. So I think uh, we have to know, you know, what you meant by quantum biology. So, uh, you know, uh, if it's just synthetic bio and adding on the quantum layer, uh, probably earlier. But if it's what I'm thinking about, the things like, um, uh, you know, how do you actually uh, use, for example, uh, quantum uh, uh, quantum robotics, right? Uh, that in, that can basically become part of a, a human person, right? So that is totally different. <laughs> Uh, quantum agriculture, yes, uh, I think the this area is, 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 and also power, uh, uh, energy is a big one. Uh, I've spoken to several uh, energy startups uh, in the quantum space, uh, you know, things like in the windmill, uh, looking to create algorithms to basically uh, harness the windmill uh, uh, the, the way the windmills are angled so you could harness the um, uh, optimize uh, power generation uh, and power capture. Uh, there are a lot of work in looking at the energy grid. Uh, so that is uh, definitely, uh, those will definitely get funding. Uh, I, the If I were to choose between quantum biology, quantum agriculture, and the, the power aspect of it, I, I think you'll probably, they're all a little farther, uh, but the nearest I would say would be more on the uh, agriculture and power biology so far <laughs> okay another question uh from paul power uh how do you protect your intellectual property at startup stage patent yeah so well you, you there there are things that so finding a patent doesn't mean it's protected right so one thing that you could also think about is uh you don't have to file a patent you just keep it a trade secret Right, so so that's how one way for you to protect your uh, intellectual property. Uh, the the other is, you know, of course, you you have to uh, you have to do a uh, a provisional patent. But the, the problem with patent is the moment you publicize it, people will look at that and say, oh gosh, I could do a better patent, right? I could do better technology. Yeah. So uh, the patent is only helpful if it's more of a utility base. It has broad scope. Uh, but if it's something that is like uh, something that is so focused and is, is an area that could be easily improved, uh, I would suggest you 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 look into your you work with your IP patent lawyer to look into your patent strategy and how you apply for patent and see if you could bundle patents together, different areas, uh, different uh, different types of patents that under one patent, so it becomes more of a utility. So there are certain approaches to that. Uh, but the the biggest one that if you you know if you have a secret you keep it a secret sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so last three questions. Uh, another one from Burns. Uh, we have an existing MOU between our local science board DOST with Hungary on quantum computing. Would you know Hungary's focus and why the Philippines? Yeah, I, yeah, I'm not sure about uh, Hungary's focus uh, and and why the Philippines, right? I, I think it's if the if the uh, if the problem that they're trying to solve is more agriculture focused, then Philippines would be a, a good one to mm -hmm. kind of go for, right? So, I guess it depends on uh, what kind of uh, problem that they're trying to solve uh, and what they see in the Philippines, right? So. 
if they see if they see a lot of proof of concept clients in the ag agriculture side, then of course it, it totally makes sense. Uh, but one thing that uh, you know, I think this question is around. Uh, we don't have uh, we don't have the right kind of talent to actually do something uh, this complicated there, right? So one thing that you could do is actually this is a good opportunity to start training Filipinos uh, to be part of this exactly. and and see if there's some sort of like knowledge sharing, knowledge transfer, uh, and collaboration from that standpoint as well. Okay, so uh, another one. From Meklas, uh, Devkota, how can we make our developing quantum startups immune from this recession? So that that that's been a question that's been asked to a lot to a lot of VCs, including me. Um, so if you take a look at the current uh, market, right? So the you know here in the U.S., we're close to being in recession and just bad market inflation and all that stuff. Um, a lot of the big tech companies that are already out there in public markets are uh, being hit, right? Because they're out there. So their valuation, uh, their valuation and their, uh, and their, uh, gone down, I think uh, at an average of 30 to 40%, uh, some of them, like some big companies, the one company that I know of, uh, went down 85%, one at 45%. So it's definitely a big hit. Uh, but for quantum startups, you know, especially if you're an early stage, you you are a little bit more resilient because you have a longer time time horizon to build your startup, right? So, so by the time that uh, you know when you start coming out in two to three years, the market had probably changed. So, uh, I think it's a good time still uh, to basically build your startup because early stage companies always have resiliency when it comes to. Uh, these uh, market up, upturns and downturns. Uh, on the VC side, uh, the the investors are still there. There's, there's, you know, to them it's like uh, we want to put in money because the, these companies are cheaper right now from a valuation standpoint. So the investors will invest in uh, in pre-seed and seed level companies. So go start. Don't don't wait. Well, uh, a lot of people have uh, added more questions <laughs> so we have here another one from from burns buena obra um i have both experimental physics optics imaging femtosecond lasers optical workbench and engineering design and development and about five years of industrial scale agriculture what road to take uh experimental physics optics imaging femto laser yeah, I so so quantum and uh, and and uh, photonics have a good intersection, right? So I think what you want to look uh, look into, especially if, yes, like engineering, design, and development. I see him as some you know somebody that can actually create the quantum and or photonics devices uh, and chips, right? So some of the companies I funded are basically uh, in this space. One is a fabulous uh, uh, quantum silicon uh, chip company out of Indonesia, actually. Uh, and another is a uh, quantum photonics uh, chip company and computing company out of uh, University of Virginia. Uh, with his level of, you know, uh, optics imaging, you know, so he's already in the uh, photonics space. He has some engineering design and development uh, kind of capabilities, uh, I would look into how, how do I actually create the, uh, new kinds of chipset, quantum ASICs and, and stuff like that. Okay, so that's uh, advice for you, Burns. Uh, <clears throat> so another one from Rafael Revert. Um, how do you see the quantum computing cryptography market? And uh, what do you think the market need in the next five years in the quantum crypto field? Yeah, so, well, the quantum uh, uh, cryptography is definitely a hot topic, right? So uh, here in the US, uh, there's been several directives uh, from President Biden about uh, uh, about uh, uh, cybersecurity. And also the uh, we have a standards body here called NIST, N-I-S-T. And they, they recently announced the 
the three quantum uh, cryptography algorithms that they're going to support the standards. So that means. So what that means is uh, the uh, the government here in the U.S. will clamp down and say, "Hey, enterprises, I need you. I need you to start uh, start planning uh, how you're going to support." Uh, quantum cryptography, right? So if you listen to that question alone, right, is how are you? How are these enterprises going to support quantum uh, cryptography? There's a lot of work that needs to happen there, right? So they need somebody needs to assess what what, what the issues are, where the holes are. So there's an assessment industry that's going to happen. Uh, there's going to be a lot of consulting uh, engagement going to happen with these organizations. There's going to be new kind of cryptography being overlaid on top of uh, on top of existing classical cryptography systems. So there are going to be migration and system transition uh, services that needs to get done with these enterprises, right? So uh, all of that needs all that all of that planning aspect needs to be done now. I think it's more because it takes a while to basically do these in large enterprises. So I would say, uh, if you are in 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 consulting services in and uh, doing assessments and uh, you know um, uh, in that in that space of supporting that, uh, it, it's it. I think it's prudent for you to start looking at that as like business opportunities. Um, you know, a lot of people are saying uh, it's going to be like Y2K, I think it's going to be bigger than Y2K, right? So so in terms of impact, uh, in terms of like the amount of work that needs to get done, and uh, so I think there's going to be a lot of uh, things happening around it, uh, not specific to the, uh, not specific to the uh, building of the technology, but the, the specifics on how to, uh, to implement and migrate and deploy. Thank you for that. Um, another one from Nestor, uh, Nestor Lim. What is your preferred quantum computing as a service platform and why? Yeah, so uh, my preferred is actually not, you know, not to go with a single, um, uh, a single uh, quantum computing approach, right? Because I, I want to be able to try uh, all of them. Uh, there's a startup out there uh, in, the, in the US that basically have created a single interface uh, to uh, to multiple quantum computing hardware, and and basically uh, their innovation is you code once and it has a transpiler that can transpile to many different types of quantum computing, uh, quantum computer uh, hardware or quantum machines, right? So it's not about uh, so so to me it's about my experience uh, in having good experience in trying to develop something as opposed to. Oh gosh, I have to learn Qiskit. Oh gosh, I have to learn the IM. <laughs> okay. Oh gosh, I have to. So you, 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 so that's why you know I like funding the, these kind of companies that can help uh, the, okay. the user experience. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question uh, from Philip Nikolaev. How do you see the quantum random number generation scene? Only four startups uh, claim that they have verifiable random crypto safe scalable quantum number generation why is verification hard yeah I, I think there are just because it, this is a good question from Philip but there's definitely a lot of uh, just different approaches to uh, random number generation right so there are some that are just a software based approach uh, that there are some that are just uh, hard the combination of using hardware. Uh, and things like that. So there are some that are just like pseudo ran random number generation. So you have to be careful. Uh, so the validation is actually, you know, you, you need to make sure uh, you, you actually look at, you know, you have scientists really look at uh, the way, the method in which they're doing the random number generation, whether they're truly random or not, right? Uh, I, uh, I, I, ID Quantique, I think is the, uh, the, uh, the company. Uh, they're well known uh, in this space. Uh, they are partnered already with Samsung. Uh, their chip, their quantum random number chip, is already in the next generation Samsung mobile phone, right? Mm -hmm. So you can see that that's also a production level quantum. Uh, uh, it's not a quantum computer, but it is a quantum yeah. chip doing quantum security, right? Yeah, so yes. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, follow-up question: Is this a big market? 
Uh, it's uh, the uh, yeah the random number generation market. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's a big market. However, uh, there are uh, there are many competitors going to the space because it's a, a little bit of a lower hanging fruit. Okay, so this is a uh, have a final question here. Oh, okay. So, so um, what what do I need to study and research on in making quantum hardware or chip? Yeah, I, I think you. Lesson. Yeah, you you definitely have to uh, uh, study quantum information science, uh, quantum physics, right? And and really not just you know not just at the bachelor's level or a master's level. You actually need to get your PhD, right? So a, a lot of the let, let me give you an example. Uh, one of the startups that I funded, uh, you know, they have they have five PhDs as co-founders. Uh, four of the PhDs are all full-fledged professors in a well-known university. Each of the professor have its own lab, and that's why they're able to create, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, quantum computers that uh, they're they're envisioning, right? So, quantum information science, uh, quantum physics, right? Uh, theoretical and applied, uh, and stuff like that. Um, I, I, those are the kind of at a PhD level. Okay, so I have a question. Um, uh, uh, yeah, this, this is going to be the final question. It's um, I'm actually very um, interested in in your career. How did you go from you know from here in the Philippines and going to where you are right now as a um, as a VC? Yeah, that, I hope that's yeah. a good. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, as you can see, I have a lot of white hair. <laughs> so it, it's been a long journey. So coming from the Philippines, uh, that basically went to uh, went here to the states. Uh, uh, for, I basically, you know, I, I tell you, I, hum, humbling roots, right? So I, I started off, uh, you know, didn't have work experience here in the U.S. I did a lot of things. I did uh, anything from um, medical billing to, you know, uh, uh, managing computer networks, uh, uh, even being a waiter, Bobby, right? So I was also a waiter at one point, right? Uh, so I had three jobs. I started off just to make sure I get the work experience and because they do look at it uh, from here in the U.S. They, they like to see that you have work experience before any big companies to take you. And then after I've uh, pretty much uh, done that, uh, somebody took a chance at me uh, on me, uh, and you know hired me as uh, somebody to do data and uh, analysis. Uh, so I did data analysis, uh, and then after that, uh, I pretty much grew my career from data analysis to uh, solution architect to manager oh, to wow. director. So uh, and basically uh, at the end of it, I'm an enterprise platform architect, uh, you know, very, I'm very technical, right? Uh, and then I, and then after that, I managed an entire uh, solution architecture group. Uh, then I was given a promotion to, uh, to head up the technology innovation fund and, uh, and uh, innovation team. Uh, with Kaiser Permanente, uh, which is a large enterprise here. So I was put into uh, the whole innovation stuff. Uh, so I funded companies to uh, to basically do proof of concept work inside of the organization. So that's, I think, started my career in terms of funding and working with, you know, leading edge emerging tech type companies. And then after seven years of doing that, uh, after year, seven years of doing that, Bobby, I, I came out and said, you know, I love what I'm doing. Uh, I created a wow. bigger ecosystem. So I, I, I basically created an innovation ecosystem consisting of, uh, you know, uh, so many investors, a, a virtual accelerator and uh, uh, working with corporate clients and bringing them all together for uh, for for success. Right. And then. Since I have an innovation eco ecosystem, it's very natural for me to basically go into the uh, into the VC world, right? Uh, I get asked a lot, you know, how come Nardo, how come you didn't have a fund? So uh, I started the fund last year, um, and then after the, you know, since quantum and photonics are still in its nascent stages, especially quantum, uh, it was also natural that I create the accelerator. So to help, you know, to help uh, this ecosystem 
uh, take place, right? So uh, it, it, I think it's uh, definitely uh, uh, maybe right timing, right situation, right, uh, right kind of experiences. But something that you need to do, Bobby, is if you're interested in becoming a VC um, and looking into that area, there are actually VC accelerators and schools out there that you can uh, that you can attend right so uh come talk to me if you're interested in becoming a vc i know, <laughs> I know how uh, there are vc schools that i can point you to that i think uh, you'd be suited for well uh do you need to have lots of money to be a vc <laughs> can you repeat the question do, do you need to have do you need to have lots of money to be a vc i, you, I mean you, personally you, no, you don't. Uh, I, I think what what you need to basically do is uh, take take an inventory of what you've done right in the space and mm -hmm. and see if you can create a track record. If not, then uh, there are ways to go around doing that, right? So, for example, uh, there are a lot of VCs before they even get to become VCs, they start off as being a venture partner, right? So, a venture oh, okay. partner is a partner in the VC. It, 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 they they work in a VC firm. Helping the uh, the general uh, the general partners or the managing partners of the VC uh, do certain things, right? So some of them are scouting uh, for companies. Some of them are you know helping with fundraising. Some of them are helping with operations. So you could start it off as a venture partner or a venture scout, right? So to help you create your track record, and once you have that, then you can apply to VC school and get trained for that. Create, you know, figure out your what area you're interested in investing in and what your thesis is. And there's an entire process for doing that. Uh, it, it's definitely a very rigorous process, Bobby. I, I, I would, uh, and, and you got to be prepared for it, right? Uh, yeah. uh, but it's definitely possible. Uh, you don't, uh, you don't really need a lot of money. You, you do have to put in some. Right, but it depends on how much you're raising, right? So, for example, uh, uh, if you're raising a, a five million dollar fund, right? So, uh, a a if you're uh, a GP, will have to commit commit one uh, percent, right? So, to show that you are committing something. So, but you can also mm -hmm. say, I don't need to raise five million. Maybe my first proof of concept fund is just two million. So I, I'm only putting in 20,000, right? So uh, mm, okay. it's, it's, you know, from that standpoint, it's not a lot, but uh, you know, you're able to create your proof of concept. And then once you create your track record, then, you know, uh, your second fund could be larger. You could go to 10, 20 or whatever. Wow. So, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Nardo, for, for this, uh, you know, very nice event. Um, if you can see the the the, the messages, um, there's a lot of people thanking thanking you for this uh, quality event. So, yeah, so thank you very much. Um, it has been an honor for us that uh, you spoke at our event. Uh, it really means a lot to the to the Philippines, especially because you're a Filipino and uh, we look up to you uh, in this regard. So yeah, so thank you. Thank you everyone for attending the event. Uh, thank you, Nardo. And uh, yeah, goodbye everybody. Uh, see you in our next event. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.